This is DJ Octaviopus, owner and director of Project Equestria Productions. Today we present to you Triple X by Al Makino. Uh, this is a story about Sly Klump, who is a laid-back slacker who runs one of Ponyville's only porn shops on Source Saddle Street. He is a regular customer at Hard Cider's Gentle Cult Club, The Knife and Apple, where he regularly shoots the breeze with Rainbow Dash, who has seen better days. One day, his employee quits and he is forced to hire a new one, starting a new awkward relationship with Lyra, who needs cash. What follows is a light-hearted fic with dark undertones that I hope you'll enjoy. Um, no, this story is not a club fic, but we will rate it at PG-15 for some adult situations and language. There's a dark secret on the edge of Ponyville, just off of Main Street. It's strategically positioned just after the main entrance to town, but it's inconspicuous enough that you'd have to be looking to find it. It's what you might call the underbelly of Ponyville, Source Saddle Street. To be blunt, this is the street for hookers, druggies, strip clubs, sex shops, and just about anything else you can think of that you wouldn't expect to exist in this seemingly cheery town. Like, for example, the establishment I ran. The sign that displayed my establishment's name was in a sultry font. The door had a flashing neon sign that said, Phillies, Phillies, Phillies. Some of the more tame posters for flicks that I've gotten over the years were plastered up all over the windows, and there were at least 17 triple X stickers on the storefront. Yep, the Maribor is a porn shop. Now that I think about it, the atmosphere inside was pretty strange. The back half of the store was lit by a few bare fluorescent tubes, illuminating my four aisles of illicit material with their sickly yellow light, while the front half of the store was lit only by a few candles shaped like cigarette lighters. It was a pretty strange choice of decor, I must admit. The front part of the store used to be lit by tubes as well, but I couldn't stand the glare of them, so on a whim I had taken all the ones over the counter down when I first came to own this place. I had planned on replacing them all, but just before I had started taking them down in the back half, I realized that I didn't have enough money to buy new lights. So, after cursing my stupidity, I went out and bought those candles, and that's what my decor has remained. I should probably get around to changing it, though. I've had more than one customer shuffle nervously out of the store because they thought some crazy occult business was going on. Or at least that's what the doctors told me. I turned in my chair and reached behind me, grabbing my freshly opened pack. It contained 12 little sticks of heaven. Well, make that 11. I cursed under my breath as I fumbled with my lighter. Years of practice hadn't made it any easier to do this with hooves. Unicorn smokers have it so much easier. They can just imagine that their cigarette is on fire, and lo and behold, it is. I looked at my reflection in the small mirror on the countertop. I stroked a hoof across my great cheek, and I was easily able to feel the bone underneath. I just naturally didn't really eat much, but that didn't really help my appearance. Suddenly interested in how I look, I stroked the hoof through my black mane, attempting to smooth down the unruly mess. I was dismayed when it almost immediately popped back out to its original state. I sighed and looked down at my cutie mark, wondering if my special talent was looking sketchy. Triple X's was a bit uncreative, but it did get the message across that this wasn't a guy you wanted your fillies to be around. Which was totally unfair, I'm not at all interested in that fetish. It was 2am, almost closing time, and just a little bit past peak hours. Though peak is an overstatement in any sense of the word, since only around 5 customers came in tonight. I yawned, and decided I'd close up shop early. I groaned as I lifted myself out of the chair and then locked the front door and passed by my new business cards on the way upstairs. Sly Klopp, owner, Maribor Adult Entertainment, they read. I now regretted my decision to have my name in the largest type, as I've never been particularly fond of it. What was with Dad? Who names their only son Shady Fuck? Yeah, thanks, Pops. May you rest in peace. I turned off the fluorescent tubes, ceasing their sickly yellow light. I walked upstairs to my pitiful excuse for a living space. In it was a simple mattress, which smelled like it hadn't been washed in months. It hadn't. With a low-end computer on a desk on one side, along with a half-broken chair and a mini-fridge on the other. I realized I had forgotten to use the bathroom before coming upstairs, but I decided I couldn't be bothered with walking down them again. I had gone fairly recently anyways. I stubbed out my cigarette in my bedside ashtray and collapsed into bed. It hadn't been a very exciting day today, but that was normal on the days I didn't go to Hard Cider's Gentle Colts Club. 
The doctor and I alternated the late night shift, which means I'd have tomorrow night free to go to the club. Hopefully, it'd make the day less monotonous. I closed my eyes and drifted off to sleep. Well, I'm sorry that things have turned out this way, but I've come here to say I quit. Well, that wasn't the wake-up call I was hoping for. I had woken up two minutes ago to the sound of incessant rapping on the shop door, and I was surprised to see when I got down there that it was an excited Dr. Hooves making the racket. I had hoped he had come to do my shift in hopes of earning some extra bits, but he dashed those hopes quickly, adding on to my already grumpy mood. I scowled at my now ex-employee. Hooves, what kind of half-assed idea do you have now? Ah, uh -uh. it's not Hooves anymore. It's Love Doctor. Oh boy, here we go again. I had to restrain myself from face-hoofing. For as long as I've known him, the doctor's had this crazy idea that he's one of the most respected play colts in the entire town. But really, he's just one of those ponies who gets good at talking to mares when he's drunk. It's gotten him with a mare or two, but he always finds it hard to remember how he made that happen the morning after. <sighs> okay, love doctor. What does this have to do with you quitting? It has everything to do with me quitting. He held them up in front of his face, and a strange grin began to stretch from ear to ear, as if his hooves were diamonds or something. Ugh, what are you talking about, hooves? Stop doing that, you look like a pedo. He ignored me. I'm serious about quitting, Sly. These hooves have made many a mare beg for more. And now it's time to put that skill to use. The love doctors love counseling for stallions. I can see it now. His creepiness level rose even higher as he acquired a faraway look in his eyes. If I was a more rowdy stallion, I'd punch that smug look clean off his face. But I prefer to be a stallion of words instead. If you work them well, they sting harder than any punch. So, let me get this straight. You're going to make ponies pay you just to have you talk about how to pleasure a filly? Hooves broke from his strange pose. That's right. Just think about how many lonely stallions there are in this town. I rolled my eyes and turned away from Hooves. The doctor had definitely gone off the deep end now, considering you just have to walk outside to see that mares outnumber us stallions by at least five to one. His plan made about as much sense as the Hydra on Hydra DVD I was inadvertently looking at. It sometimes amazes even me what's stocked in the obscure fetishes section. I turned my head back to hooves and looked him in the eye. A little part of me had hoped this was all a joke, but with that hopeful look in his eyes, I saw that he was very sincere. <sighs> okay, hooves. If you think this is a good idea, I have no way to stop you. I'm not your boss anymore. Thanks, Light. Now, uh, about this week's final pay. Yeah, yeah, here it is, I said as I unlocked the drawer in the desk with its key. That's another thing that unicorns can do so much more easily. It's hard to hold on to the key with your teeth and get the drawer open at the same time. You can't even really see what you're doing. I gave the doctor his last paycheck. He grabbed it in his teeth and merrily hopped towards the doorway, a blissful smile on his face. Wish me luck! Huh? D yeah, yeah, sure. Good luck. The doctor closed the door behind him and trotted away. You'll need it. Well, that was a great start of the day. If the doctor hadn't quit, he would have relieved me two hours ago. I had gotten a few customers today, mostly nervous stallions. Big Macintosh had come round to pick up the latest DVD in the Cockadoodle Doo series. He's as giddy as a school filly when the newest one of those comes out. Kind of scary to see a guy as big as him skip out the door. It's just porn. Snips and Snails had also tried to trick me again, but being the incompetent fools they are, they once again did not succeed. Don't they know that the trench coat mustache stand on one another's shoulders trick is the oldest in the book? Even my pops faced that one frequently. I'd gone through more than half of the pack of Marlboro cigarettes I started on last night. I realized I couldn't mine the store for another five and a half hours, and my mind made up the pretty terrible excuse that the thin haze of cigarette smoke in the air would somehow suffocate me if I didn't get out of here. I somehow managed to convince myself that this was true, and decided that even though it would just hurt business further, I should go somewhere else. Like the knife and apple. I grabbed the keys, locked the door, and trotted across the street to the place. It was pretty inconspicuous from the outside, just a little wooden sign flapping in the warm summer wind the logo of a knife laying beside an apple painted in the center. The bar, and Brothel's name was written in mahogany on a pretty fancy sign above the doorway. The discreetness of the exterior was a stylistic choice, though, not a necessary one. 
Prostitution has always been legal in Equestria, though it has been frowned upon for as long as I can remember. The bouncer nodded as I walked in. I'm one of Hardsider's closest buds, so he gave me a lifetime free membership here, which covers the fee I'd normally pay at the door. Despite the frequency of my visits, though, I don't think Hardsider is losing any money off me. I usually buy a healthy, or rather unhealthy, amount of drinks. I opened the door and went down the stairs. Here's a fun fact. My dad died right here. It wasn't anything violent. He just drank too much and fell down these stairs. I was only barely old enough to run the shop. As strange as the codger could be sometimes, I cared for him, and it really hurt when I heard the news. But I've learned to put the past behind me. The stairs didn't actively try to murder him anyways. They're pretty swanky carpeted ones, too. They probably have never had a bad thought in their lives. Or any thoughts, for that matter. I arrived at the bottom of the steps, and I was once again taken aback just by the sheer length of the space. The bar itself already was of a pretty considerable size, and the space around it could already be considered a complete establishment. Instead, though, it continued on to a dining area. A couple of booths were on each wall, their fake leather reflecting the light from the overhanging lamps. A scarred wooden table lay in the center of each. Past that, the hardwood flooring suddenly changed into a plush carpet, marking the beginning of the stage area. An arc of about forty velour seats surrounded the wooden stage, a silver pole standing in the center of it. Crimson curtains covered the brick wall behind it. Hard Cider waved at me from the bar, snapping me out of my reverie. He's a distant relative of the element of honesty, though he's not the most respected member of the Apples. And that's what you get for running what is essentially a whorehouse. A few of the regulars were already seated at the bar, and one of the strippers was pole dancing in the back to what I must say was a pretty sizable crowd of stallions. Of all the places on Sore Saddle Street, this gentle colt's club really was one of the only shops where business was booming. Hardsider's tawny coat shone under the warm glow of the overhanging lights. He brushed some of his dark brown mane out of his blue eyes with a hoof. What'll it be, Sly? Uh, just the usual Applejack Daniels number seven side. Now, if you're wondering, that's actually not named after the element of honesty, rather a relative of hers. As Side went to get the bottle, the Pegasus beside me turned her head towards me. She was also one of the regulars, as well as one of the only females that ever came back a second time. She looked me over with her ragged eyes before speaking in her usual raspy voice. So, how's the Mirborough these days, Sly? She took a sip of her martini as she finished her question. Could be doing better, I replied. I assessed her with a glance. Her cyan coat looked like she hadn't washed in at least a week, and her multicolored hair was dull and flat. Rainbow Dash was not the mare she used to be. If you're wondering how she got like this, it is a story. Only about a year after she and the other five elements defeated Discord, the Wonderbolts came to her and asked if she wanted to join their training camp. Because this was Rainbow Dash's dream, she quickly accepted, only stopping to say quick goodbyes to her friends. RD being RD, she got through camp in only a year, one of the fastest times of any Wonderbolt. And then for another year, she was one of them, soaring through the skies at high speeds, living it up at all the big shows, and basically doing everything she ever wanted to do. And then it all came crashing down when she was found in bed one morning with Spitfire. For professional reasons, in-team relationships were strictly forbidden. Spitfire was lucky, because her name and face were displayed on t-shirts, coffee mugs, stickers, and any other item the Wonderbolts thought would turn a profit. She was spared serious punishment. Rainbow was not so lucky. She was thrown out like last week's trash, and her name was smeared all over the tabloids and gossip rags. You'd think someone who saved the world twice would get more respect. Rainbow returned to Ponyville after that and tried to get back to her normal life. It just wasn't the same, though. She had fallen from such a lofty plateau that she couldn't stand being on the bottom rung again. Both now and before, ponies would look at her with a disbelieving look on their faces and point out to their friends that this mare was, in fact, Rainbow Dash. But not too long ago, they'd do it with wonder in their eyes, and they'd usually ask for an autograph afterwards. Now, though, they did it with tinges of worry, and just pure astonishment at how haggard Rainbow had become so quickly after her return. Even Rainbow's friends couldn't really clear the dark cloud hanging over her. Eventually, she turned to drink and found Sore Saddle Street. I had felt sorry for her, as anyone who lived in Ponyville probably did. She could barely even keep her job on the weather team. 
We became friends when I saw her at the bar a third night in a row, just basically drinking herself to death. I had intended to only go over and tell her not to drink so much, but I guess we somehow clicked, and I didn't even need to say anything in the end. She was too pleased to have someone to talk to to remember drinking. When Rainbow Dash was happy, she really was a thrill to talk to. I was glad that I finally found someone to talk to at the club, since Hard Cider was always too busy serving drinks. What happened to her still sucks, though. From what she's told me, it sounds like she could have been the captain of the Wonder Bulls or something. You could be doing better. Join the club. With that, Dash snapped me out of my thoughts, and I sat down beside her. Even though Rainbow has gotten a bit better since she first came back, her days are still not going very well. Every other day, something happens at her job, and on the off days, suddenly a new problem comes up, one that usually involves the bits she does not have. What happened today? I asked. She swirled her martini around. The usual. Crowd Kicker was fed up with my antics, and she shouted at me for like five minutes. That's nothing special, though. What's eating you? Uh, Dr. Hooves just quit. He did? B but why? Rainbow Dash gawked. I've always described Hooves as a great employee, and a good friend, too. We've always been on good terms. After I befriended Rainbow Dash, Hooves and her started hanging out at the bar, too, and Rainbow knew him almost as well as I did. I suppose he neglected to tell her about his little plan, though. I rolled my eyes. <laughs> I don't know. He has some crazy scheme. Thinks he can make money selling relationship tips to stallions. <laughs> He'll never make anything. I know him. I mean, really. I don't think Barry Punch could even count. I know. He's really full of himself this time. He's convinced he'll be famous or something. <laughs> That'll be the day. Sure will be. Side, get me another martini. We both shot the breeze for a while after that, both of us downing a few too many drinks. Before I knew it, we were both cajoling the stripper with the rest of the raucous crowd. Take it off! Rainbow Dash shouted drunkenly, swinging an empty martini glass. I recognized the stripper as Lola, one of Hard Cider's best. She had a dark red coat and a magenta mane. Her cutie mark was a pony just like her pole dancing, though it was partially obscured by her lacy underwear. You could always tell a real professional from a fake by their cutie mark. All of Cider's regulars were the real thing, with genuine tramp stamps, as stripping cutie marks were sometimes called. Cider sometimes gave non-pros a chance on amateur night, but as you'd expect, most of them were nowhere near as good as the pole dancers who had this art form as their special talent. Lola stood up against the pole, her body facing the audience. She swayed her hips from side to side as she started to tease her panties off. My session is almost at an end, colts and fillers. Anyone want to buy me for the night? A coffee-colored stallion with a crazed look in his eyes barged past me, knocking me into another patron. <laughs> Hell yeah! He screamed as he slammed a bag of bits down on the stage, his cheeks as rosy as Lola's coat. Lola kicked the bag up into her mouth, judging its weight. <laughs> Feels good. She said, her voice filled with presumably fake, lust. She gracefully hopped off the stage and led the drunk stallion into the back room. I've always liked how the room has a sign of a knife piercing an apple core above the doorway. Whether Hard Cider had realized the sexual part of his club's name when he opened it was debatable, but he sure was taking full advantage of it now. Oh, come on! You call that a strip tease? That could have been shown to Phillies! Refund! Refund! Rainbow Dash shouted as she angrily slammed a hoof against the stage. She could be a pretty rowdy drunk. Though she couldn't really ask for a refund, considering she'd never paid the stripper. Lola had been... exciting. But I definitely wasn't done for the night. I still had a lot left in me. I felt like getting smashed tonight so I could drown my sorrows at the thought of never getting another night off in good old hard liquor. So it was back to the bar for a bit for me and R.D., downing a few more drinks. At this point, as you might expect, everything started to get a little fuzzy. I could sort of remember Card Shark and Aces High, the local poker pros, asking us if we wanted to play a game with them. Even in our state, I think we could pretty easily figure out we weren't going to do well. There wasn't much entertainment left besides poker, though, as most of the patrons had left by this time. I had intended to spend all my bits when I came here tonight, and since I couldn't drink another drop of alcohol, for some reason I felt I should spend it on getting my ass whooped in a card game instead. Luckily for me, R.D. felt the same way, so at least we could take our fall together. Small pot poker then commenced, with hard cider dealing the cards. 
RD was a pretty good player when sober, and I could hold my own when sober as well, but we both just sucked in our drunken states. We must have been wearing anti-poker faces. In contrast, Card Shark and Aces High didn't touch a drop, and they played their absolute best. I'm not sure why they really cared about annihilating two ponies who were almost in comas, and for only 20 bits each, but we let them. Artsider finally bucked us out somewhere between 2 and 3 in the morning. RD and I had to support each other to even get across the street to my shop. I have no idea how she got herself home. Hopefully Card Shark and Aces High were more sympathetic in real life than in poker. I hobbled upstairs and collapsed onto my mattress. I was asleep in ten seconds flat. Ugh, my head. I rolled off the bed and crawled over to the stairs. My head felt like a freight train had just crashed into it. After nearly falling down said stairs, I got into my bathroom and I barfed for about twenty minutes. That's definitely the least enjoyable part of getting hammered. I walked over to the counter, which was luckily still shrouded in darkness. I reached into one of the bottom drawers and pulled out the old Help Wanted poster. <laughs> Haven't put this up in a couple of years. I walked outside. Ah, the sun! Get it off, get it off! <sighs> and ran back inside. Okay, let's try this again. I shielded my eyes and walked outside. I put up the yellow poster with its bold 48-point letters. It made the shop look even more tacky if that was even possible. Hopefully I could soon take that thing down. One of the more prominent things on the counter was a small TV. It used to be upstairs where the computer is now, but now I just watched it whenever customers weren't coming in and used it as an expensive clock. I popped a cigarette in my mouth and turned the TV on, noting that it was a few minutes shy of noon, so it was just about time to open the store. I forced myself to get up and turn the closed sign around. I sat back down at the counter and began to channel surf. Time for probably the first of many monotonous days staring at a screen and wasting away. B? Yes, that's, uh, that's two Bs there. The lovely vivid white touched her hoof to the board twice, revealing the two letters. B-BS and C-NTS, the board now said. The category was movie. Boobs and cunts, I shouted, pointing a hoof at the contestant. Say it! Wheel of Fortune was not my favorite show. I couldn't care less for word puzzles, but this TV only got five channels, and if I had to watch this crap, I was going to enjoy it. The competitors this lovely afternoon were a fat plumber from Manhattan, a gardener from Ponyville, whom I didn't know, and a stuck-up fashion designer from Trottingham, who had just announced her letter of choice. Pony Sajak turned back towards the stuck-up mayor. Okay, Royal, would you like to spin or solve? I'd like to solve. Okay, then. What's the answer? Even from where the camera was, you could see a bead of sweat roll down her cheek. Oh, my Celestia, is she going to actually say it? Uh, boop and boop. Damn you, family-friendly reruns. Taking away all my enjoyment. Pony Sajak just stood there with his mouth hanging open. One of his eyes occasionally twitched. Vivid White and the other contestants looked equally shocked. Royal still looked snooty as ever, as she had once again closed her eyes and turned her nose up. She patiently waited to see if her answer was right, but there was only awkward silence for a few seconds. Finally, Sajak pushed his jaw back into place with a hoof. Uh, that ain't right. Well, now what else could it be? Yeah, uh, sorry to all the families at home who had to hear that. Play pass to the gardener who quickly announced she'd like to solve. Burbs and Sense. What kind of a movie name is that? Yes, that's it. Great movie about buying houses in the suburbs, I might add. Said Sajak, trying to put the whole situation behind them. I grabbed the TV with my hooves and shook it like a madman. Some ponies are rowdy when they're drunk, but it's the morning after that brings out my inner beast. Aw, oh, come on! Royal's answer was way better, you fu- Only then did I realize that the door had opened. A cerulean unicorn mare stared wide-eyed at me in my disheveled state. Great. I just blew my first sail of the day. Well, no hope in salvaging it now. What'll it be, miss? Dawn of the Dick? Masturbator, salvation. James Bondage, Goldfinger? Give it to me. The unicorn looked around nervously and bit her lip. No, uh, sir? I'm looking for a job? 
Don't say hoof or blow. Don't say hoof or blow. Don't say hoof or blow. Hoof or... I, I mean, hoof will be a resume and we'll see about it.